Sahana Vavatu, Sahano Bunaktu, Sahaviryan Karawa Wahe, Dejas Vinavadhi Tamastu, Ma Vidvisha Wahe, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. To understand the context of chapter 11, we first have to go briefly to chapter seven and 10. So in those chapters, the cause of the universe is called in English, God. In Sanskrit, Ishwara. So when you think of God, don't turn it into some big you know, mystical uh, entity, some big daddy sitting somewhere. It just means literally cause of the universe. And this cause is understood from two standpoints. First is the intelligent cause, and the second is the material cause out of which effects are born. When I say intelligent cause, I mean the intelligence which changes or modifies the material to become the final product, which we then call a name depending on its form. So if the material looks like a pot, then we invent a name for it and we call it in English, pot. So this means first comes the form and on the basis of the existence of that form, we then attribute a name in our local language. That's why we say names and forms. It's more like forms and because of the forms, then we attribute the names. For example, a carpenter is the intelligent cause of the furniture that he or she will make. What does this mean? This means the carpenter has the knowledge, has the framework, has the blueprint how to create the sofa. But that's not enough. The carpenter also, being the intelligent cause, requires the material cause, the wood, in order to create the final product, which serves a useful function for the sake of helping people move on with their lives, like sitting down and reading a book. So in that same way, anything in the universe needs both the intelligent cause and the material cause. So what does this mean? It means that the material modifies by the help of the intelligent cause to become the form which we then give a name to, which we then experience. For example, Whatever conversations you speak of, suppose you walk into a, gold, a, a store, a jewelry store, and there's a lot of forms there. You don't have to call them what they are, but there's a lot of forms there. Now, suppose you start having a conversation. Oh, wow, look at these forms all around us. Bangle, chain, ring. We just have a nice conversation about these forms. What are we actually only talking about? We're only talking about the one gold. Now, why do you not say to a juver, hey, I want gold? What's, the, what's, the, what's he gonna say? What's she gonna say? Um, can you stop wasting my time? What do you want? Or, I mean, you know, I mean, it all resolves into one gold anyway, so what's the point of saying the name and form if it's all just one content? What's the juver gonna say? Sir, the exit door is over there. So even by the presence of the one content, in and through all names and forms, you still cannot speak as if everything is one. Even though you know everything is one, but you still deal in a world where you have to use the name because there is only forms. And because there are forms, I have to then attribute names so that we can transact and live a successful, meaningful life. So it means, what does this mean? It means you do not need to dismiss the ornaments and you do not need to work separately to recognize the gold. But through all knowledge, that means through all ornaments, you understand through knowledge, even if I speak of these ornaments, they're actually only gold. So this means there is no question of rejecting names and forms as if they are mitya, as Mina was saying, because without Mitya, how are you even going to say anything? Because who's saying it? Mitya, which is actually of the one content. 
Now, in the same manner, you do not need to dismiss the world and then work separately to recognize the absolute reality, which we call God in English, which we call Ishwar in Sanskrit, or the other way, which we call Atma, which means self. By the way, I will not use the self very often because tell me, who in their real life uses the word self? Hey, self thinks about the ocean. Self wants a glass of water. Self thinks this is a good idea. You don't speak like that. You say I, first person pronoun. So Atma, what is Atma? It literally means I am. If that I am is placed in the body-mind complex, then Atma means body-mind. If that I am is placed in consciousness, Brahman, then what does Atma mean? It means Brahman. This means Atma modifies according to what the person understands of themselves as the I. Now, a little analogy to help us understand. Gold is called gold from the standpoint of the cause because without the gold, what, is there, what products can you say? You can't say anything without the gold. So from the standpoint of the gold, it's called gold because it is the cause. That same gold is called ornaments from the standpoint of the effect. So this means cause and effect are really one same material. Whether you talk about the cause, it's the one material. Whether you talk about the effect, it's the one material. Another way to look at it is the cause is the one material from the standpoint of potential names and forms. And the effect is the one material from the standpoint of manifest names and forms. So this means the goal is one material in potential. Ornaments is one material in manifest. So this means when you, you know, when, how do you call it, sculpt the gold, then that becomes the effect. But whether you're talking about the effect or the cause, you're only talking about the one content. So using the above analogy, using this analogy that I just mentioned, what Krishna is pointing out is in chapter seven to 10, is that Ishwara, and Jagat, the world, can never be away because Ishwara is the cause and world is the effect. Why is this so? Because when all effects, that means names and forms, resolve, they all obtain into the one final cause, Ishwara. Just like if you take all of the, those jewelry uh, pieces in the store and you melt them, that means you melt all of the effects, what ensues, what comes final, the one gold. So this means Ishwara is Ishwara from the standpoint of unmanifest, Ishwara is still Ishwara from the standpoint of manifest. And we are now experiencing manifest. So this means we are never away from Ishwara. Now, if you understand this, if this knowledge is properly understood or let's say the world the knowledge is not properly understood then the world you will call it the world the world is just the world the world's like this the world's like that if you do understand this properly then the same world becomes an embodiment of Ishwara so this means how you speak about the world changes it's no longer the world is going through a hard time or like this Ishwara I see laws and orders operating. So in this case, when the knowledge is firm, then this world becomes chapter 11 title, Vishwarupa Darshanam. And what is Vishwarupa Darshanam? Knowledge that all forms are pervaded by the one cause. Okay. Now this, we spoke in chapter 11, this perception change, this, understand, this perception based on understanding is what you call Divya Chakshuhu. What is Divya Chakshuhu? Divya Chakshuhu I will explain soon, but for now it is a perception change based on understanding. So this means that Vishwarupa Darshanam is not, again, is not some extraordinary experience that you're supposed to feel maybe in a meditation or something. It's an attitude change that's gradually cultivated through your self-inquiry. 
So the more we self-inquire into reality, the more this Divya Chakshuhu expands. Thus, our Vishwarupa also expands. Now, let's give you a simple example. Ladu. Suppose you have Ladu. Uh, Ladu is an Indian sweet made from... You tell me, what's Ladu made from? Made from basin flour. Uh, sweet, uh, right? Sugar and... Yeah, it's a sweet. You make it from basin flour and then you um, squeeze it on a ball and fry it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, fried uh, in uh, basin flour and then you squeeze it on with ghee and sugar. Uh, uh -huh, okay, so we're talking flour, ghee and sugar. Is it healthy? Uh, well, <laughs> uh. If it's a prashadam, it's healthy. <laughs> if it's not a prashadam, it's unhealthy. <laughs> Okay, we'll just, we'll just stick with that hesitation. Uh, so it is generally not considered healthy because it's just sweet, right? It's so, you better have all your fillings filled out because it's going to make your teeth sore how sweet it is. <laughs> so we see this ladu as an embodiment of an unhealthy, just suppose, an unhealthy sweet, a generally unhealthy sweet. Now someone says to you, yeah, however, this ladu that you're now holding, it's just a ball, you know, a ball of ladu, has been blessed by the priest in the temple. So what happened here? Two, two principles took place. Number one, you have gained information that this object, which I'm perceiving, has been blessed by the priest. I've received this information. And second, you need to understand what it means for an object to be blessed. If you just receive the information and you don't understand what blessing means, then it's like, great, thank you very much. You know, the weather, the weather is hot today. You don't make much of a story about it. So you need to not only receive the information, but understand what is the implications of the fact that it's been blessed. Only then what happens? This immediately invokes a different attitudinal change towards that same object. And this new attitude towards the ladu is what we call Divya Chakshuhu. So this means the one object has not changed in appearance. It's exactly the same as before except only to my information, my education, which takes place in Vedanta, and the implications of what it means to be blessed, I change my attitude towards this one object. Another example is uh, the pop star Michael Jackson, um, or you can take Prabhu Deva from India, you know, the cool guy, Michael Jackson moves if you know him. Um, now the pop star Michael Jackson, uh, once he died, one of the journalists said that his mansion of furniture was auctioned. And the journalist said that through the association of Michael Jackson, this mansion, you can, the sky's the limit. You can sell things for a, an amazingly high price. Without the association to this mansion, you won't even get one tenth of the price that you can, uh, with the association to Michael Jackson. So what does this mean? Number one, you should be a fan of Michael Jackson to consider his furniture and his mansion worthy of purchase. You, you know the story, right? Where his mansion and furniture was sold for a very high price. Why are people willing to pay such a high price? Name and form. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if, you're, if you don't know Michael Jackson, are you going to pay, you know, $30,000 for a sofa. No. So what uh, has to happen for suddenly to change your mind and justify it and say, I absolutely want a sofa for $30,000. So, uh, so uh, it doesn't have an intrinsic value. It has some kind of extrinsic value. Is that what's happening? Good. So the value. Okay, good. So you touched the point at Pavan, right? Yeah. Okay. So Pavan has touched the point. So this means the value through the association of someone that I know who is meaningful to me, only to what I know about him or her, the value increases. So in that same way, and by the way, before I move forward, a single song of Michael Jackson is not going to make you a devotee of him. It's only going to make you a devotee of him for maybe five minutes. So this means you should know lots about Michael Jackson. Put posters on Michael Jackson. Know about his biography of Michael Jackson. Not just one hour. Or biography. That's not going to make you a devotee of Michael Jackson. What will make you a devotee? Obsession. This is called devotion. So this means in order to be devoted to something, 
I have to not only have information about what I am devoting to, but also I have to spend time associating and getting to know it through years in order to say, yes, I want to buy this furniture for $30,000. It's not an overnight process. So this means devotion takes years to develop. So let's extend this example to the entire universe now. How do you develop spontaneous devotion towards not just Michael Jackson, but let's expand Michael Jackson to the entire universe. Suppose the entire universe is now called Michael Jackson. What has to happen? Go back to Michael Jackson. You have to know what you are devoting to. I have to have knowledge of this person. And not only that, but I also have to spend time getting to know the details about this person. So if you take this to the universe, I have to know the nature of the reality. And then I also have to know the details about the nature of reality. One has to immerse themselves and a proportion to how much and how long they immerse themselves is a proportion to how devoted they are. Just like two lovers. How do lovers start? General, right? You know, there's a little bit of devotion, but through the course of years, and you know, the partners here will speak much better on this topic than I will. Um, you know, your devotion, uh, you may nod your head if you agree, your devotion to your partner generally increases through the years as you uh, find comfort and joy to share your life with them. Is that true? I'm not talking about those other moments of here and there, that's all part of the relationship, but just generally your devotion increases. This means your love for the other person increases. Why? Because you're spending time getting to know them. You're sharing moments with them. So this means you're immersing your world and their world. You're bringing them together. So in that same way, when a person, when a student spends time learning Vedanta, immersing themselves into Vedanta, then devotion grows. And what happens if your devotion grows? Your, real, your reality becomes more pure, less objections, less, um, you know, less uh, space for contradictions more clarity starts to come. So this is what Kritika was saying. You, know, you may not feel like you're not getting it, but the more time you spend, which is actually the only way through these, uh, these non-understood uh, knowledges that we're holding is to spend time immersing yourself. So through this two-step process, I get to know the nature of reality and step two, I spend time immersing myself. What happens? Your gradually your perception towards reality changes. And this is called Divya Chakshuhu. And what's the reward of this? Vishwa Rupa Darshanam, which is the title of chapter 11, Vishwa Rupa Yoga. Now, verse one to eight, and put a subheadline. verse one to eight of chapter 11. Arjuna asks, Krishna, how can I gain this Vishwa Rupa Darshanam? We'll be talking about the rewards. Now, how do you gain this? What does Krishna say? He says, it requires a qualified mind, Arjuna, endowed with Divya Chakshuhu, which I will talk about in more detail. And then Krishna blesses this Divya Chakshuhu temporarily to Arjuna. That means he blesses the right attitude for Arjuna. So the question is now, what is Divya Chakshuhu? Why am I asking this question? Because in order to, in order to enjoy Vishwarupa Darshanam, to see reality, depthful, to see layers of reality, you have to have Divya Chakshuhu. So the question is, how do you gain this? What is Divya Chakshuhu in the first place? We spoke about it is a mind that is a refined notion of my and mine. So now the question is, how do you refine my and mine? I didn't say eliminate my and mine, as you will hear in some schools. There's no such thing as eliminating here. You don't need to eliminate anything. Just refine it. How do you refine my and the strong, you know, my son, my money, my house, my knowledge, my ignorance? How do you refine this or reduce it? This is called vairagyam. Nagesh, you want to say? Yeah, okay. Yeah. This fashion. This means yeah. the more I get to know, step one, the more I get to know about the nature of reality, the more I am less inclined to hold on to things. Because you're only holding on to what? The one content in and through 
all, the one gold in and through all ornaments. It's like holding on to the ring. Well, let go of the ring, my friend. It's uh, the same as the chain because it's all one content. So this means as long as objects or experiences are mine, then the person will limit whatever they're holding onto as mine to their biases. For example, suppose you say my experience of the sun is soothing. Now the question, is sun just soothing or is it much more than just soothing? <laughs> it's much more than just soothing. But because it's my experience of the sun, I have taken this vast object called the sun and I have now attributed it to no more and no less than just soothing. Why? Because I made the sun mine. So this means when a person makes an object mine, then whatever that person knows, that is how their relationship will be with that object. If you have a criminal make a, um, a you know, um, money mine, then that relationship is going to be very different than if you take a genuine worker who says money is mine. So what does this mean? It means in order to sustain this Vishwarupa Darshana, in order to see layers and depth of reality without lives going on and off, what do we need to do? We need to remind oneself or yourself that nothing here belongs to me not even my relatives. They too belong to the one cause, Ishwara. Not even my body, not even my epiphanies, my education. Sure, it is there, it is helpful, but don't claim it as yours because the more we hold on to this, the less Vishwarupa gets a chance. So Krishna, having suppressed Arjuna's Temporarily, my and my notion, Arjuna thus was able to notice depth of reality. Mina, you want to say? No? Okay. Verse 9 to 14. 9 to 14. Sanjaya gives a description of Arjuna's vision. Now, first, how did Sanjaya see Arjuna's vision, because that implies Sanjaya was also given Divya Chakshuhu by Krishna. But we know that's not true because Sanjaya was, you know, with Drhtarashtra and, Sanj and Arjuna was on the field with Krishna. So one way to explain this is the commentators uh, will say that the word Sanjaya in Sanskrit means one who has conquered, the one who has freed oneself from, of what? of the notion of my and mine. And this is one explanation how Sanjaya was able to retain pure intentions despite serving an unrighteous king like Dhritarashtra. If you've seen the story of Mahabharata, Dhritarashtra was making the wrong choices because he was misguided. But despite the fact who was Sanjaya, his close consort, his charioteer, and despite that he was not influenced by his decisions, he was still able to remain pure. So put yourself in the same position. Suppose now you are a close consort of a powerful person and this power, like uh, someone from World War II, for example, and this person is clearly going down the wrong path and you're the closest associate of this person. Imagine how strong you would have to be to remain pure despite the influence of this person's decisions. That's Sanjaya. And because he was so pure, he was thus able to narrate the story of the Bhagavad Gita. He was able to see this vision given to him by Veda Vyasa. So Sanjaya says, Arjuna is witnessing the Lord with thousands of limbs, legs, arms, thighs, stomachs, heads. Now imagine you read this by yourself. What's the first thing the mind is gonna do? Innocently, it tends to imagine a Lord with thousands of limbs. Therefore, don't imagine this. It's not 1,000 heads attached to one entity. How big of a neck would that have to be? It means, what does this mean? Lord with 1,000 heads, you tell me. Lord with 1,000 heads, what does this mean? What's the symbolism of this? Uh, like all seeing or um, all sensing, all connecting, just a grander view of everything. 
Yeah, good. That's a good creative way to look at it. Um, uh, you know, all seeing all four di- in all directions, not all four, but all directions. And the other way to interpret it is that means all bodies, all heads, all limbs, all legs, all belong to the one Lord. All ornaments belong to the one cause. So what happened then? Arjuna's first impression, because this is Arjuna's now first time seeing this Vishwarupa, because he asked the Lord. His first impression turned, went through three stages. So Arjuna asking the Lord for Vishwarupa Darshana, what happened? He went through three stages of experience. First one is wonderstruck, then fear, and then surrender. Kind of like a new relationship. First you're wonderstruck, infatuated by the other person. And then we get to know them, right? We get to know the, the reality of them. So we're uncertain. So there's some fear there. And then when we resolve the differences, then we end up surrendering to them even more. Verse 15 to 22, stage one, Arjuna's wonderstruck condition. So this is where Arjuna, like I said, if you fall in love, what happens? Flowers everywhere, right? Rainbows everywhere, music everywhere. It's all beautiful. In that same way, Arjuna's positive outlook of the universe peaked. He saw incomprehensible beauty, undefined by words. He was wonderstruck. And this is, by the way, how Vedantins feel the more they start to assimilate this knowledge. I don't know if you feel like this, but I certainly do. The more you discover Vedanta and these laws and orders, the more you want to, or you take more interest in sciences, more interest in astronomy, more interest in biology, more interest in the animal world, more interest in quantum physics, genetics, psychology. Why does this interest peak? Because now you're putting these sciences on a foundation. In fact, all of these sciences are a testimony of Ishwara's laws and orders. So you say, well, where is it? You just look at these sciences and you will see the amazing uh, beauty uh, that, that is demonstrated. In fact, I wish as a young person was in biology because I don't think there's a greater example of appreciating Ishwara than through uh, looking at cells, cell growth, cell replication. Uh, I mean, Gokhnur, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> okay, so in other words, in science- Oppenheimer quote Gita, in Oppenheimer and uh, Einstein quote Gita. Uh, open what? Uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Um, uh, a German guy. guy who invented the atom bomb. Yes, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he read the Gita, probably interpreted in a different manner. <laughs> okay. Um, now, so, okay, why, why do you take interest in sciences? You tell me. Because someone shook their heads, you know, you feel like that. Okay, good. Why do you feel like that? Yeah, because you can learn the details of everything Good. and 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 you you don't just learn a random information you learn something which has been proven which has been investigated by many people so yes. you maybe not 100 percent sure but you are more certain than anything else that you can explore good good so yeah yes um being a cardiologist, um, just a, a, a more awestruck now. How, uh, like, we don't, we can answer how, but we can't answer why. I can tell you how the heart beats, but I'm wonderstruck why it beats, and that affirms to me that, that there's there's the Ishwara. Um, so yeah, it, it, if anything, it, it uh, I now realise how much I don't know. Yeah. Uh, like a little child, right? You just yeah, to... like a child. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Robert. Yeah, uh, there are about sixteen fine constants that operate as laws in the quantum field, and they're very exact. And if any one of these constants was out by even a small amount, the universe couldn't exist. So it's completely irrational not to conclude <clears throat> that there's an intelligence that has formed these constants. And it connected them, and the brain intelligence is much greater than a human intelligence. Ah. Uh, it serves as a proof. You know, I mean, anything serves as a proof. If you just look, uh, you know, if you look at it in the light of the scriptures, the animal world, you know, the, 
the interconnectedness, the um, animal hierarchy, you know, the lion eats the antelope, the antelope depends on the grass, the grass depends on the rain, the rain depends on the clouds, the clouds depend on precipitation, precipitation depends on water, water depends on the sun to be evaporated into the clouds, the sun depends on hydrogen and, uh, turning into helium through the process of fusion, which then sends to the surface of the earth through the process of electromagnetic radiation, which reaches our senses. How many, how far away? Eight light minutes away. You can see the beautiful interconnectedness at every level. We started at the line and now we're back into our skin and we took a little round trip to the sun through the process of um, hydrogen and helium, fusion, electromagnetism, and then that speed, also defined by the laws and orders, reaching your senses, which are able to pick up that fusion reaction that's happening in the sun. Okay, someone. Uh, for me, uh, personally, I, uh, uh, I started with uh, quantum physics and then came to Vedanta. Uh, wow. It's like um, I started contemplating about uh, electrons, double, famous double slit experiment, if you know about that. Um, so, so science says uh, electron has some you know, uh, mass, charge or something, and, and it follows some rules. Uh, uh, but, but, but science says that even the deists uh, say that you know, God has created all these objects and given the rules to follow. But I always wondered, okay, so God has given a rule to electron, so does an electron have a mind of its own to follow? I mean, how does an electron know that there is a proton out there and then I have to go? I, we have minds, right? But electrons don't have minds. Mm. So, so, so I thought, you know, God is not someone who just created an electron, but God is the electron, it has to be. And God is not just the programmer of the universe. God has to be the computer of the universe as well. Yeah, yeah, good. Because, and good, yeah. good power. So from so. there, I went to uh, Vedanta, like... Uh, uh, everything is consciousness. So I, I started reading that. Yeah. yeah, this is a common story. What Thomas is saying is a lot of scientists uh, who are unable to find or not satisfied with you know, the final form, the, the smallest particle in the universe, then they look to Vedanta for solutions. So um, we, by the way, don't disagree with anything that science is saying. We just provide more clarity. Uh, in particular, quantum physics, I find absolutely fascinating because it is a technical manner to you know, understand the universe. It's just uh, utterly fascinating. Okay. So again, it's all of these uh, principles that I'm talking about. These uh, different sciences are living testimonies of Ishwara. And what is Ishwara? Two causes. Nimitta Karanam Upadana Karan. The intelligent and the material cause. Okay. Verse 23 to 30. Stage 2. 23 to 30. Stage two is Arjuna's fear. So Arjuna has gone through wonderstruck. So Arjuna here starts to see the mouth of the Lord. Again, don't imagine a big mouth of the Lord. It is symbolism. What is the symbolism of? It's a representation of the principle of time in the form of Srishti Stiti Laya Karanam. In Srishti Stiti Laya means creation, sustenance, and destruction. Because it's the battlefield, that principle of time is going to be represented as laya karanam, the destruction aspect. This means Arjuna saw soldiers entering, being eaten. What does this mean? What does this now symbolize? It means through the course of time, everyone is chewed, everyone dies. This means time itself is a great chewer of bodies because it's the battlefield. So Arjuna is seeing bodies. Now, Arjuna could come in terms with these bodies entering the mouth because you know you don't know these people so they're not your relatives except who two people bishma and drona his teacher and his grandsire now why is this why did he not have full dispassion towards all people entering the mouth he had an exception why is this is this it's because we discussed Divya Chakshuhu was artificially given to him by Lord Krishna. So this means any artificially inflated or given experience by someone external to you will have flaws like Shaktipat. You know, Shaktipat, they give you some, uh, I don't know what they are supposed to give you. So, okay, whatever it does, I'm not going to dispute that, but it doesn't last. In other words, just like an artificially ripened fruit, is it going to taste well as it could? 
an artificially ripened fruit cannot taste as an originally grown fruit. So this means anything artificial like drugs, you know, LSD, mushrooms, ayahuasca, iboga, um, all of these are artificially. Now they may help. We're not disputing that, but the person defaults back to their their default condition. Now, in addition of seeing this big mouth, Arjuna notices Bhagavan enjoying his dinner because Bhagavan is chewing the bodies they're walking in. And this dinner wasn't an issue for Arjuna because Arjuna has already understood through the former chapters two to uh, 10 that the principle of time, you know, it destroys, everyone has to go. So this wasn't an issue. However, Arjuna got upset when he saw Bhagavan's dinner enjoyment in reference to my relatives, which were Bhishma and Drona. So Arjuna, unable to accept this vision, that it's like looking at the mouth and now you see people entering, right? Just imagine. And you're like, okay, that's unfortunate. I mean, you know, everyone's got to go. And you start rationalizing, right? The intellectual person starts coming. Oh, okay, that's, that's how life is. And then suddenly you see your mom and dad going in. Intellectualism goes out the door if it's not firm, if it's not properly ascertained the reality. And not that it, not that it should be the special, oh, it's just mom and dad, you know. It's not, we're not talking about um, being cold, but you can see what situation Arjuna is in. So Arjuna, unable to contain his upset for his relatives, for my relatives, he finally says, Krishna, who are you? I thought you were the benevolent one, but now I see you chewing up everyone. And what, is the, what does Krishna say? He replies in verse 31 to 34. Verse 31 to 34. Krishna says, I am the principle of time that removes the last moment to give way for the new. And since Arjuna, you're on the battlefield, this principle of time that sweeps the old to give way for the new is in a form of destructive time in the form of death. If you asked me, Arjuna, the same question, who are you in a maternity ward, what would I say? I am the principle of time in reference to creative time because it gives birth. If you ask me the same question in life, I would say I'm the principle of time that sustains. So it depends on where you're asking the question, that's the kind of answer you will receive. So what is Bhagavan doing here? He is reminding us that both death and birth are integral aspects of living. I think Mina was saying this, um, right? That both of them need to be embraced. Okay. Then verse 35 to 45. This is stage three, Arjuna's surrender. Question we ask, what is surrender? Surrender means aligning one's capacity to choose, one's ability to make a decision, as Gokhtur was saying, aligning one's free will to the universal order, which we call Dharma. Aligning one's free will to Dharma equals surrender. Because the question is, what are you surrendering to? We often speak, oh, I surrender. Okay, my question is, what are you surrendering to? to the universal order called Dharma. For example, suppose all of us are now in an orchestra. Nagesh is playing the violin, Gokhtar is playing the guitar, Lloyd is playing the piano, Pritpao is playing the flute, Kelsey is playing um, the drums, okay? And so we're all playing an instrument right now in an orchestra and there's suppose 20 of us. What comes with the orchestra besides people? the orchestra piece. What is the orchestra piece? The music that you will play, right? So it's called a piece. So this orchestra piece is what we can call the foundation. This means it is the universal order in reference to that setting in the orchestra. So the orchestra piece is the universal order. So what happens in an orchestra? Every one of us is going to use our free will, our capacity to exercise our, exercise our knowledge and play the instrument and then we're going to align that ability to what? The orchestra piece. 
because that's what you've been told. You're going to play Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 7, for example. So you need to use your skills, your free will, to play the instrument so that it, it is aligned with the orchestra piece. Now suppose one of us says, you know, I want to show my individuality. Like I'm really good at my instrument, but I just want to like show my individuality. And then Kelsey, you know, is like, you know, she's like doing these soft, gentle taps and she just goes crazy now. She just starts whacking the drums. What's going to happen to the orchestra piece? It will no longer be Beethoven Symphony Number no. 7. It will be a mixture between that and some punk put together. In other words, everyone is going to notice. The entire orchestra piece will go out of alignment. Why? Because my individuality has become louder or brighter than the universal order. So this means when I use both ways, remember, I'm using my free will when I'm in alignment with Dharma, but I'm also using my free will when I am not following Dharma. So both ways I'm using free will. But what does the former way do? It sustains peace, sustains harmony. What does the second way do? It breaks that harmony. And who suffers? Not only the 20 individuals, but also the spectators. So this means to surrender is to surrender to the universal order. And how do you do that? By aligning your actions to the orchestra piece according to what's called your swadharma, your knowledge. So this means when your individuality, what does individuality mean? your capacity to choose, your free will, is in alignment with the universal order, that's called surrender. Next question is, how do you align yourself with the universal order? First, you need to get educated because what is it that you're aligning to? You need to know Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 7 in order to align to it, right? So this means I first need to get educated what is it that I'm aligning to. So I need to know the presence of these laws and orders called Dharma. And second, I need to see, you need to see how violating them is not in your best interest. For example, suppose that a rebel, rebellious you know, person says, oh, I don't believe in gravity, you know, it's all a uh, you know, conspiracy theorist, you know, it's all just, um, you know, out there, they're making these stories or flat earth, and you just, you know, make up these stories. And then you go off a building, oh, you know, I don't believe any of this. Who's going to fall? you will fall. Why? Because I refuse to align myself to the presence of what is already true. So this means I need to understand not only the presence of laws and order, but I need to see how it is in my highest and best interest to align myself because it is for your own good. If I don't know about gravity, then who gets hurt? The person who doesn't know about gravity and who's also refusing to accept the presence of gravity. Now, once Arjuna was able to appreciate this order coordinated through Bhagavan's intelligent and material cause, what happened then? All Arjuna could do was perform namaskara, prostrations to the Lord in all directions. Because what else can you see? You're seeing, wow, all of these things I've been reading in the scriptures, they're now coming true. I see how they're interconnected, as they were saying how they're all working together to produce this world that we're living in now. And I see how every cause and effect has led me to where I'm enjoying this life now. Now, together with Arjuna's frustrations, gratitude, what also happened? He was also simultaneously frightened. Why? Why was Arjuna also frightened? You tell me. He was grateful, but he was also frightened. Uh, we spoke about Arjuna's fear in chapter 11. From, can you hear me? Yes. Um, from memory, was it because he was still identified with the body-mind-sense complex? Good, Thomas. So Arjuna forgot to include himself as one non-separate from the orders that he was witnessing. He was standing as a separate witness going, wow, fascinating. This is so beautiful. Prostrations thousands of times, oh Krishna. And yet he forgot to include this very prostrator that he is not separate from to the prostrated. And thus he asked Krishna to withdraw this Vishwarupa back into Avatara Krishna, a normal, relatable human being. 
this leads us to verse 46 to 55. 46 to 55. Here, Krishna says to Arjuna, you have had a rare opportunity to witness this Vishwarupa because of your sincerity, because of your bhakti. Now, what type of bhakti? I think Robert was saying, ananya bhakti. What does ananya mean? The word ananya literally means no other, no second. So this means it's a bhakti whereby there is no second to whom I am devoting to other than the one cause. So this means, what is ananya bhakti? It means one is a sincere desirer of truth. You want to know the truth. You want to live the truth. You care about the truth. It also means one who understands Parameshwaraha, we will finish in 10 minutes, as not as a means to worldly goals, but as the final end, because Parameshwaraha is the limitless one. So they stop using God as the one who fulfills my desires, even though there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, but it's just that the focus changes. I want God himself. Now, if you think about it, how do you stop asking for worldly desires and you start asking for God? What has to happen? What shift has to happen to go from uh, asking for more worldly success? Nothing's wrong with this, by the way, but just to change your focus. What has to happen? Does, has it got something to do with liberation becoming the goal of life instead of material? Good. And what comes before liberation? Uh, the two qualities of the mind have to happen. Uh, before liberation, you need to have purification of the mind and also focus. Good. So focus and purification of the mind come through two qualities, vairagya and viveka. What is viveka? Discrimin oh. Good. Discrimin okay, good. So discrimination, that means from what to what? So this means I discriminate worldly forms because I see the essence of them. So this means I don't get caught up. It's just like going to a toy store. It's not like you're putting down those toys. You're just seeing where those toys fit. So this is process of self-inquiry. Now this self-inquiry extends from the toy store to the entire world. And also through the process of doing this, you develop this passion because you see the nature of this thing. Then Krishna, and we'll finish uh, soon, Krishna finally now concludes with the benefits of Vishwarupa Darshanam. So now you say, okay, so what about this Vishwarupa Darshanam? How is it going to improve the quality of my life? What will it do for us? So first of all, Krishna says is the person through Divya Chakshuhu, which leads to Vishwarupa Darshanam, stops splitting the world into likes and dislikes. This means the person stops putting the world into boxes. Like this is worthy of my time. This is not worthy of my time. And what does this do? It results in a calm and composed mind because the mind is no longer, you know, uh, preoccupied with what it likes. And if I don't get what I like, then I'm antsy, frustrated. So when this is reduced, then the, per then the mind's naturally calm and composed. At the same time, it is alert and active. Now, who doesn't want a calm and composed composure, at the same time alert and proactive in life. How do you get that? By, by putting aside this need to categorize things into black or white. And this way, more opportunities get captured because before the opportunities was rejected on the basis of my like and dislike, but now the opportunity comes anyway. And then I see through my viveka whether it's worth my time. If not, I reject it. The second benefit is one develops one of the highest human traits, which we call amanitwam. This is called humility. Uh, and humility is, okay, what is humility? It is the recognition that all of the excellence in me and others, it all belongs to the original giver, Bhagavan. Not that you shouldn't claim and enjoy your skills and talents. That's a part of a human experience but the person doesn't take full ownership of it, always keeps in the mind. This is indeed from the original creator. And this also removes the pressure to appear special and important. You know, that pressure of having to stand out. Why is this pressure there? 
because the person sees the world as absolute reality. When you start to see the world as you put it in the right place, it's just ornaments. Wherever I look, it's ornaments true, but it's also of the one gold. Then the person no longer has that pressure to stand out. He'll look at me as a ring, look at me as a chain, look at me as a bangle, because I know that all are all the one content. And the other benefit that Krishna said was the person stops categorizing the world into sacred and secular, spiritual and worldly. I don't hang around with worldly people. That stops because that is still an immature mind, putting things into boxes. The person sees that everything is sacred because everything is of the one cause. And what does this do? It removes the need to compare oneself to others, which produces low self-esteem. This means the person also starts to acknowledge and appreciate other religions, synagogues, mosques, churches, temples. All of them are refuges for the person seeking God. What's wrong with them? Nothing. So this means the person now puts them also in the right place. This is called objectivity. And this sums up chapter 11. Next week, we will proceed with structure of chapter 12. And then we will have time to also go through uh, verse 1. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha. Sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kaschidduhka bhag bhavet Om shanti 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 hi May all be happy. May all be free from illness. May all behold good things. May no one suffer.